All right, so does this very analog piece of uh, newspaper look familiar to anybody? How many people here, show of hands, has read something from the New York Times Privacy Project? So that's a lot. <laughs> um, so when Florian and I started putting together the agenda and sort of a wish list of, geez, who could we invite to our Data Privacy Day celebration, Privacy in Michigan? Uh, the touchstone for us over the past year or so has been this privacy project because we individually, both ourselves, people we work with, are our sort of drum meters, advocates for privacy, wanting to get more people involved. We only have a certain audience that we can receive, uh, get to. The New York Times is a pretty big audience. So it was really heartening to us that this project existed. And the person who jumped to the top of mind to invite for today's keynote was Kathleen Katie Kingsbury, uh, deputy at editorial page of the New York Times, and, and the showrunner, such as it is, for the Privacy Project. So Katie's career has included stints at the Boston Globe and Time, among other media organizations. And over the last year, she's edited, wrangled, and cajoled the New York Times Privacy Project, which, if you didn't know, is an expansive series of investigative journalism and commentary on the privacy implications and innovations in the information society. She's, she was awarded the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Editorial Writing for Service Not Included, a series on low wages and the mistreatment of workers in the restaurant industry. <coughs> the series also received the Scripps Howard Foundation's 2014 Walker Stone Award for Editorial Writing and the Burl Osborne Award for Editorial Leadership from the American Society of News Editors. And if that wasn't enough, she also edited the Boston Globe's 2016 Pulitzer Prize winning commentary on race and, and education. We're excited to have her here today to look into and behind the scenes of the Privacy Project. So, welcome, Katie. Thank you, Saul, Florian, for inviting me here to be to be here today. It's an honor. Um, Robbie, you stole some of my best lines. Actually, thank you for highlighting such um, so well some of the Times recent reporting on Clearview AI. Um, so, I apologize in advance, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, excuse me if I need to take a, a cup of water here and there. We've all been making some big choices, consciously or not, as advancing technology has transformed the real and virtual worlds. That phone in your pocket, the surveillance camera on the corner, you've traded a little bit of anonymity, of autonomy, for the usefulness of one, the protection of the other. Many of these trade-offs, were clearly worthwhile. But now the stakes are rising, and the choices are growing more fraught. Is it OK, for example, for an insurance company to ask you to wear a tracker to monitor um, to whether or not you're getting enough exercise and set your rates accordingly? Would it concern you if police detectives felt free to collect DNA from a discarded coffee cup and share your genetic code? What if your employer demanded access to all your digital activity, so it could run that data through an algorithm to decide whether or not you're trustworthy. As many of you in this room know, these things are already happening in the United States. Polling suggests that public anxiety about privacy is growing as data breaches at places like Facebook and Equifax have revealed how much information we've already traded away and how vulnerable we can find ourselves when it's exposed. <coughs> Following the example of the European Union, which type, type, uh, toughened its privacy regulations in 2018, officials in city halls, state capitals, and Washington are considering new rules to protect privacy. Industry leaders are simultaneously scrambling to influence that debate and write their own rules. So what should those rules look like? It is a federal crime, for example, to open a piece of junk mail that's addressed to someone else. Listening to someone else's phone call without a court order can also be a federal crime. The Supreme Court has ruled that location data served up by mobile phones is also covered by constitutional protections. The government can't request it without a warrant. But the private sector doesn't need a warrant to get a hold of your data. There's little to prevent companies from tracking the precise movements of hundreds of millions of Americans and selling that co copies of that data set to anyone who can pay the price. So as 2019 began, it seemed like a good moment to pause and consider the choices we've already made and the ones that lie ahead. That's why the Times Opinion section launched the Privacy Project, which has become a year-long initiative to explore the technology, to envision where it's taking us, 
and to convene debate about how we should control it to best realize, rather than stud or to score, human potential. From the get-go, we meant for this exploration to be thorough and to the debate to wide, range widely. From arguments to radical transparency, to whether corporations, through their access and detailed information about so many of us, have already gained dangerous power to manipulate how we perceive the world. This project would also inevitably con consider the work of the New York Times itself, along with that of other media companies, since the newspaper's own commerce depends to a degree on the gathering and sharing of people's data. We hope to hear from the public, from technologists and policymakers, whistleblowers and tech executives, advocates and academics, and anyone else who had an original and important solution or idea to contribute. To date, we've published more than 160 editorials, op-eds, and videos aimed at informing that debate and advocating for protections to the privacy that many Americans probably hadn't realized they'd already lost. I want to talk about a few things that we learned as journalists. As most of you probably know, there is no explicit right to privacy in the Constitution. The world of privacy doesn't even appear. Um, as our contributor, Tim Wu, has written, the notion of privacy for everyone, rather than just for the rich, is a relatively in recent vintage. Maybe it's time is passing. People may tell pollsters that they're worried about their privacy, but millions have also happily been paying some of the world's most all-seeing corporations to install listening devices, such as Alexa, in their homes. It may be that, as some of our contributors have argued, a world in which people more freely share intimate details will be a world that's more honest, healthier, and more <coughs> fair. On the other hand, privacy came to be recognized by the United Nations as a universal human right for good reason. Privacy sustains freedom, space for free thought and expression, for the growth that comes from mistakes without public shame. It's a bulwark against the power of the state and society, the workplace, and the marketplace. So we have to deal with the incongruity between the robust legal regime around legacy me methods of privacy invasion and the paucity of regulation around more comprehensive and intrusive modern technologies. It came into sharp relief in our, that came into sharp relief in our investigation into the location data industry. The investigation, which was released in December, built on work from last year from the Times Newsroom. It was based on a data set provided to us by sources who were alarmed by the power of the tracking industry. The largest such known file to have been examined by journalists, it reveals more than 50 billion location pings from the phones of more than 12 million Americans across several major cities. By analyzing these pings, our journalists were able to track the movements of President Trump's Secret Service guards and of senior Pentagon officials. They could follow protesters to their homes and stop high school students across Los Angeles. In some, most cases, it was child's play for them to connect a supposedly anonymous data set to a name and an address to a real live human being. Your smartphone can, broad, can broadcast your exact location thousands of times per day through hundreds of apps instantaneously to dozens of different companies. Each of those companies has the power to follow individual mobile phones wherever they go in real time. That's not a glitch in the system, that is the system. If the government ordered Americans to continuously provide such precise, real-time information about themselves, there would be a revolt. Members of Congress would trample one another to get be first in front of cable news cameras to quote the founders and insist on our rights to be free of such pervasive surveillance. Yet as a society, without ever focusing on this profound choice, we've reached a tacit consensus to hand over this data voluntarily, even though we don't really know who's getting it or how they're using it. Even the regulation lawmakers are debating today is at least five years behind what the technology companies are introducing. So as at the close of 2019 approached, Everybody was searching for our meaning of the decade. We had a singular thought. This was the decade, the period since the founding of the App Store in, 20, in 2008, in which we were brainwashed as a society into surveilling ourselves. I want to be clear. The fact that Americans are tracked by the millions is not consumers' fault. There is no good faith opt-out when it comes to smartphone tracking. 
While there are steps that smartphone users can take to minimize the information gathered about their behavior, Americans who use surveillance devices like smartphones have only the illusion of control when it comes to protecting their privacy. Location data collection is only one aspect of a surveillance economy that sneaked into every corner of modern life. Tech companies have fostered a grassroots surveillance culture that has convinced millions of Americans that they are, live better when they buy smart speakers, carry smartphones, watch smart televisions, turn their doorbells into unblinking video cameras. Again, there is no question that consumers and society as a whole receive some benefit from giving up so much information. That includes better traffic maps, more targeted advertisements, reviews of nearby restaurants. In the future, smarter artificial intelligence, safer driving cars, and better medical care may also rely on location data. But there's no reason that data needs to be gathered in secret, stored forever in a manner that puts privacy at risk and allows it to be sold to the highest bidder. The dangers inherent in today's smartphones and their near universal adoption become obvious when you consider the enormity of the information being collected and how intimate it can be. A record of people visiting drug treatment centers, strip clubs, casinos, abortion clinics, or other places that social stigma can create a powerful desire for privacy. The data we received, reviewed also reveals Americans making routine commutes from suburban homes to secret government facilities, and making trips to churches and synagogues to counseling sessions and chemotherapy treatments. Privacy violations affect everyone, but they disproportionately affect immigrants, people of color, women, people who live in poverty, LGBTQ people, and the young people in our communities. Domestic abusers use surveillance tools to spy on their victims. The Department of Homeland Security uses social media history to make immigration decisions. Many of these technologies are prone to error, including potentially lethal ones. We follow demonstrators with our data from the 2017 Women's March on Washington back to their homes. We saw how the same technology is being used against pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong today. And of course, it goes far beyond location data tracking. One of our graphics editors, Sahil Chinoy, demonstrated the pervasive nature of facial recognition technology and its stunning affordability. He used a publicly available video camera overlooking a park near the Times offices in New York and ran its feed through Amazon's facial recognition software. The total cost? under $100. To prove the power and ease of the software, we identified a man, actually a college professor, walking through the park and interviewed him. And the system identified nearly 3,000 other faces in nine hours. As the protesters in Hong Kong have illustrated, so we, how, what can we do about this? As the protesters in Hong Kong illustrate, as they cut down high-tech lampposts to remove the threat of facial recognition cameras, Uprooting a technology from society is far more difficult than regulating it before it achieves universal adoption. Location tracking through smartphones is already a reality for most Americans, but putting basic protections in place can still better protect the privacy of a nation of digital citizens while still permitting innovation. If the industry believes that data is a gold mine, Congress ought to force it to adopt practices to treat data in a manner commensurate with its value. That means increased security. It means rules clear and understandable to consumers about how it will be used. It means strict oversight of data collection with penalties for deceiving consumers. It means further restrictions on collecting and monetizing the data of minors. It also means regulations that allow America, Americans to see where their data goes. As Congress considers federal privacy legislation, lawmakers could include measures to prevent the acquisition of data location data if such collection isn't central to the function of the service. For instance, flashlight apps would not be able to track your location. A central principle of GDPR, which governs privacy across the European Union, is purpose limitation, meaning the data collected for one purpose cannot be used for another. The United States lacks such a protection. Even California's new privacy law, which comes into force this month, doesn't have a purpose limitation of provision. But even in the absence of 
congressional action, regulators could be taking steps to better safeguard privacy. The Federal Trade Commission, for instance, could scrutinize data collection methods to see if they constitute deceptive practices under existing law. The 1998 Children's Online Privacy Protection Act provides assurances that children under 13 will not be surveilled by websites and technology companies without their parents' permission. But it is difficult, if not impossible, for parents to understand the scope of the data being collected and, and the stakes of having that information bought and sold. And why are the protections only for children under the age of 13? In other ways, our laws recognize that teenagers up to the age of 18 deserve special protections. Lawmakers should insist on regulations that prevent companies from surveilling the movement of all minors. Though studies show Americans are pleased by the convenience afforded by technological progress, many are either unsure or un overwhelmed by that trade-off. If lawmakers don't act, we risk the further entrenchment of corporate surveillance in our lives. It is time for Congress to hold technology and advertising companies accountable and make opting out of tracking a meaningful choice, if not the default setting. In a capitalist split by impeachment, the subject of privacy is a rare form of bipartisan concern, if not consensus. It doesn't have to be this way, said Josh Hawley, a Republican senator from Missouri. Mr. Hawley has introduced an attractive Democratic co sponsor for Do Not Track legislation that would block collection of data not central to the functioning of an online service or app. Senator Elizabeth Warren echoed that bipartisan concern. Tech companies, she said, are profiting by spying on Americans trampling on the right to privacy and risking our national security. What we have been able to show in our work reflects just a tiny fraction of the data collected from the average American on any given day. The American public should see the full scope of the corporate surveillance to which it is subjected. Lawmakers have the power to subpoena companies and demand transparency about what data they collect from American citizens and then what happens to it. The price of participating in modern society cannot be turning our lives into open books, diaries of all travel and relationships and wants and desires to be read and passed along by corporations. Corporations that are themselves not monitored or tracked in any meaningful way. Americans need to know how their information is being gathered and whether it is being used to manipulate them. They, de they deserve the freedom to choose a life without surveillance. Only the law can pro provide that to them. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. about 15, 20 minutes to do some uh, fireside chat Q&A and then make sure we have time to open it up for you all. And so first of all, thank you again for coming. Thank you for uh, a, if not uh, stimulating and uh, motivating, at least a real look at what the challenges are in terms of privacy for ourselves as citizens of the United States and of the world. So I'm gonna start with a loaded question. Um, one that I, I ask of others and my mother asks of me, which is, I try to explain what I do for a living. What does privacy actually mean to you? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, thank you again for having me. I know that a lot of what I was talking about is not new to a lot of people in this room, but one of the things that um, we have found as we've done this privacy project over the last year is that we've, as journalists, have really become conscientious and aware of privacy in ways that we weren't before. And to me, it's that sense of being able to make mistakes and human fallibility that really has resonated. It's this idea of we need privacy for human growth and for realizing potential. Um, and you know, you are asking a loaded question. I don't have a I don't have a great answer for it. Um, but I have been trying myself to introduce ways to protect my privacy into my own daily life. For instance, I will never have an Alexa in my house. Um, you know, I've started being really conscientious about what browsers I'm using. Um, I've been eliminating, uh, limiting um, in general, 
you know, what apps I allow to have be on my phone and the um, location tracking that they are allowed. Um, and I think that that has been one of actually our most conscientious goals of the Privacy Project, was to be able to help regular people figure out what limits they were willing to put on their own privacy and, um, and the sharing that they're doing and giving them the tools to do that. Yeah, so that question isn't just a provocateur question. In one of the articles, I think it's from uh, April, uh, one of the early articles, you actually discuss that privacy is really, it's almost too big to understand because it has such personal connotations. So that, that's the question. So let's, I want to pick a little bit about how you do the work you do. So how do you pick your topics? Um, how do you, you, you identify an opinion, uh, writers and commentators? Take us a little bit behind the scenes of how, how, what drives a privacy project. Sure. So as we were beginning the process, we felt one of the things that was very important is establishing a common language and understanding about what privacy is and the technologies that are driving some of the privacy invasions that we already knew about. We wanted to be really open-minded about this. We wanted to, in particular, engage with industry around some of the practices that they've adopted. Um, I, we've had we've had a little bit of success on that front. I was I was saying earlier we have um, as time has gone on we we stat we worked very hard on creating that foundation the the language question and then we moved into what we consider to be. Um, a period of debate. Um, we commissioned, tried to commission op-eds, particularly on all sides of the debate, and we found that we had a lot more success in finding people who wanted to talk about privacy invasions and um, some of the bad practices, as opposed to people who wanted to discuss the upside to some of these things. And I think there really are upsides. Uh, some of these uh, trade-offs are worthwhile. I think of particularly around biomedical data sharing and our understanding of disease. Um, when you share your genetic code, that is offering researchers some real insight into medicine. But we didn't have as many people who wanted to make that case. Um, and that has been something that um, has been very front of mind. And I also think as, a, um, as time went on, we found ourselves less and less inclined to seek out those voices because we all became way more aware of the, the deceptive practices that were happening and we were moving towards sort of a, what we've been calling our solutions period. So one of the things that's gonna be happening in the next few months is a really conscious um, campaign on the part of our editorial board to look at what federal privacy law in the United States should look like. We also tend to agree that there should be a federal law, although we still have some questions about um, state preemption. So you've covered some of the challenges in developing and sort of sustaining the series. Um, I've actually found it really interesting that you, you, whether it was on purpose or not, have identified privacy as what others call a broader subset of ethical concerns around how we use and collect and use and disseminate and share information. So uh, you've done stuff about screen time, free speech and revenge porn, parenting issues. Can you talk a little bit about how you dip your toes in those and what you may have found with this of interest? Yeah, I think that that actually, um, it, it's actually been a challenge from a journalistic standpoint. We're very good at investigations and we're very good at finding legal voices to talk about privacy and we really were pushing ourselves to think about how privacy affects people's daily lives. And, and there obviously are a lot of legal questions in that, um, and, but one of my favorite pieces we did um, was a video where we had kids confronting their parents about sharenting and whether or not it was ethical to share your child's pictures online. And it was just great. The kids were so engaged. They understood this concept of privacy almost better than their parents um, in often cases um, because I think they kind of realized the real, the real world consequences of it. Um, and, and actually, that has been the most um, widely read pieces that we've done have been around parenting and how you bring these things into your your life. Um, one of the questions we got over and over and over again from readers was like, is my smartphone listening to me? Why does it know that I want to take a vacation to Mexico when I've only talked to my husband about it? Um, and so we had one of our writers, um, Sarah Jung, write a full piece about that to kind of explain um, what what's happening and why your phone knows of that about you. <coughs> but 
Um, and, and I think that that, it, it's interesting, you and I have talked a lot about, we, we started this project wanting to really be able to explain to people the harms of privacy invasions. And it's hard. It's hard because, first of all, you know, people's attention spans are pretty limited, um, but also because they get so much convenience out of their smartphone, for instance. Um, we have repeatedly kind of had pieces where we've explained to people how to opt out of location data tracking, and they're among the more popular pieces. We often will have, you know, um, investigative pieces, and then the the pieces on how to act, the how to pieces on how to actually opt out tend to be as well read, if not more read, as the, an entire investigative series because people are, want this information urgently. Um, but then we also hear from people who are who say, um, I totally I went in, I took off all the location data tracking services, et cetera, et cetera, and then I realized I can't use Google Maps or I can't use the Starbucks app or my CVS app or whatever it is, and you know. That, that is what seems to be the constant trade-off of convenience versus, um, you know, privacy. No, I mean, I've, I've certainly appreciated that from an attention span perspective, the articles have been fairly bite-sized for the most part, and that you didn't incorporate video. So I don't want to take away too much from upcoming articles, especially in the legislative space, but you've touched on a little bit about potential for privacy, federal privacy legislation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you had an interview with Andrew Yang at one point, uh, and, and he talked about making <coughs> privacy a campaign issue. So are you looking at this upcoming election uh, cycle as a potential for more pieces around candidates and their perspectives on privacy or privacy as an election issue? Yes, absolutely. Um, as many of you might know, uh, the editorial board just endorsed in the presidential campaign. We interviewed nine um, presidential candidates as a part of that process, and every single one of them we asked them quite extensively about privacy. I think Andrew Yang, um, in certain ways, has the most developed sense or plan around this. Um, a lot of the other candidates, um, particularly Elizabeth Warren, talks about privacy from a more antitrust consideration, um, and so I feel like it's actually the same challenge that we as a journalism organization has faced, which is how do you get voters to care about it? So everyone is developing these plans, but you don't necessarily hear, you heard about them talk about it in a couple of debates very briefly, but you don't actually necessarily hear them peddling those, those plans on, on the campaign trail. Yang is kind of the exception to that. Um, he's really been trying to position himself as the internet guy. Um, and you can debate whether or not he actually is. Um, but. It is actually, the power of the social platforms, for instance, is one of the biggest power questions in the United States uh, today. And I don't actually feel like most government officials, including the candidates, have the right or fully um, developed language to talk with real Americans about that point. Well, I think some of that played out when we saw Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> in, in, in front of Congress trying to talk about Facebook and some of the yes. perhaps lack of education that some of the legislators have. Yeah, I have, I have like a, a little bit of a contrary thought on that. I mean, there is a certain part of me that kind of likes that some of these questions are so, for lack of a better word, dumb, because I don't think most people understand these issues very well. And I want our legislators, obviously, to, and lawmakers, to, to be able to ask tough questions, but I also think that we, and, and this is obviously something we were trying to do with the Privacy Project, we need to educate people just at the very basic level, and some of those questions that you heard from, for instance, Senator Kennedy, were really obvious, but people just don't realize. Um, and I think that that has been one of the bigger themes of the project, has been trying not to just talk to the elite, but try to also get people who are actually encountering algorithms and uh, facial recognition and surveillance technologies every day in their lives who are you know, either um, middle class or working class people who don't kind of realize the full consequences of these technologies and what they mean to, their, to decisions that are made about them. So you discussed a little bit 
already some of the things uh, that you published about what individuals can do, obviously getting a baseline education is, is a fundamental piece of that. Are there other things that as you've gone through the series and, and connected dots that you think what other actions that individuals could or should be taking? I mean, it's a great question. I mean, at the end of the day, the most important thing is the law to change so that people don't have to make these decisions for themselves. Regular people right now have to comb, if you really wanted to be educated about the trade-offs that you're making, you'd have to comb through hundreds, maybe thousands of pages of terms of service that are written in language that I, I find even lawyers struggle to understand. And so it would be much, much better if we had a legal framework you know, passed by lawmakers that would take some of that burden away from individuals and you could know that you are living in a society where there are people watching out for you and providing that protection through the law. Yeah, so one of your pieces was actually was about why is there no tech backlash? So why haven't we as citizens stood up to do this ourselves? <laughs> Again, it's a really good question. I think that we live in really overwhelming times and people are confronted by things like impeachment and climate change and um, you know, a, a struggling education system and kind of adding this to the burden and adding this to their plate um, when you're talking about things like social media platforms that already connect them to their friends and their communities and their loved ones um, or things like a smartphone, which again, like really do provide meaningful conveniences to our lives it's very, that's a very hard thing to ask of people to, to rise up. And I, I do think, you know, I think concern is growing. Things like the Cambridge Analytica scandal have um, opened people's eyes to what kind of information is being collected from them. But I actually think it, it comes down to, again, lawmakers being very serious about this and passing laws that protect, you know, um, people. And, you know, I think that's especially true in people who are vulnerable, you know, communities of color, children, um, you know, the laws has, even the laws that we have, have a lot of loopholes that, um, again, put a lot of burden on the individual. Too much burden. Well, I know you came into the sort of the series call and you explained that you were looking for a very balanced approach, at least early on as you set the stage. Um, I think the series is maybe dark is too strong a term, but it's gotten darker over time. So, <laughs> and speaking as someone in, that's been doing privacy work for 20 plus years, yeah, we are in a darker space. But while it seems crushing and it might be easy to give up, have you uncovered nuggets of glimmer or glimmers of hope? I think that the fact that people are becoming more conscientious about this topic and are trying to educate themselves, I mean, actually just this series itself and how much readership we've gotten for it has been a glimmer of hope for me and how people have really tried to engage with it. We've done a bunch of different call outs asking readers to provide us um, with either questions or comments about individual pieces. And so that has been really, um, given me some optimism that people do want to engage in this. I, and I think also because it has become at least minimally a topic of conversation in the presidential campaign is a glimmer of hope. And you have people like Josh Hawley who are willing to work across the aisle on this subject matter um, with people like Elizabeth Warren, but also um, you know AOC and others who have a lot of privacy concerns. Um, I'll be honest, we started this project thinking that there was going to be federal privacy legislation by the end of 2019, mostly because the California law was going to come online, which obviously did not happen, um, and it got kind of pushed to the back burner. You know, I, th I think we all know the reasons for that between impeachment and other things. But, um, and, and also, I mean, not to be too dark, but like, the millions and millions of dollars that industry has now put into its lobbying campaigns in order to um, make sure that they're getting the privacy law that they want. Um, you know, and so um, I am optimistic, however, that in coming months we're gonna see real legislation coming out. So 
maybe some delivers hope, depending on what the legislation gets. Uh, so first of all, uh, we're going to get ready to open it up for questions. So there's a couple microphones at either side of the <coughs> camera. Um, privacy, obviously, is a challenging subject, as you've now learned. Yeah. Uh, it's not going away. We hope the series won't. Uh, can you just, in a minute or two, tell us, and you've shared a little bit about it, but what's next? Where do you see this going? Yeah. So we are actually winding the privacy project down. Um, we are hoping that um, we are having a big event at South by Southwest in March that we hope will be kind of the capstone of the project. But it has marked a, a large investment by Time's opinion. We've hired eight people and we've invested a lot of money into developing a contributor network on technology and privacy specifically. So we're hopeful that we will keep pounding away at this topic. Um, Charlie Borzell, who is one of our um, writers at large in Time's opinion, has a newsletter that um, is focused primarily on privacy that will continue. Um, and so we will certainly not stop talking about this project or this, this topic. We're just going to probably do it a little bit more organically than we have been. Great. So let's open it up for questions for folks from the audience. So I'm glad you brought it around to law because initially your comment, and please don't take this too critically, is yeah. you, know, you won't have an Alexa in your house. And I'm not in any way, that's a very personal decision. But I mean, the notion that at the end of the day, simply saying this technology is the problem as opposed to how we deal with it. Oh yeah, it's, absolutely. You, you, can, you can always go back to the phone and say, you know, that I expect I wasn't there, but I expect there were people who said, I'm not gonna put a phone in my house, you know, someone could be listening. And yet we did evolve a set of laws on things like wiretapping and things like this that were very effective for many years. I mean, you really did mostly trust that wiretapping you know, required a court order, except in, most, except in some cases. So it just, I mean, I think that really has got to be the focus, not that you can just, you know, sort of skip skip the next round of technology. I am curious as to, I just sort of, I am curious as to the impact of the European GDPR it has it, you know, there was a lot of hope that that, simply the fact that people didn't want to have to have different products for different countries. From, from what you've been looking at, ha has GDPR had any of that effect? Or um, is that where we sort of just hoping for something that didn't really happen? <laughs> it's, it's a very good question. Um, and I actually completely take your point about technology. I actually, I think I should have said as part of my comment, I've actually been like very amazed as we've brought in a lot of experts into this conversation to learn about the technology and how it's advancing and how simple design choices can be, make a meaningful difference in terms of privacy. But I do think, for better or worse, the best cudgel to getting good privacy protection is through the law. And I think GDPR, while we don't really know, it's very early days and we haven't necessarily seen the enforcement actions yet, it at least caused a lot of corporations that range across um, you know, many, many disciplines to take a closer look at how they were protecting users' privacy and to start implementing some frameworks to protecting consumers. And I was saying earlier, I, I worry a little bit about how complacent we've gotten to just like checking the I agree button at the bottom on those bottom banners around cookies. But, you know, that obviously is only one small part of GDPR. And I'm, I personally think more law in this area is better than, even if it's flawed and needs to be improved, than less. Um, because I think that for years and years, we've allowed a lot of the tech companies to um, essentially, I don't want to say run wild, because that's too strong, but we've essentially allowed them to kind of figure out the rules for us and without having that um, regulatory or legal um, uh, enforcement behind making them develop better practices. One of the things, that I'll, I'll get to the next question in a second, but another insight that we've had, um, I was saying earlier, we really invited a lot of people in the industry to participate in the privacy project and we didn't get a lot of takers. We got a lot of whistleblowers, um, which has been interesting. And talking to people who have worked for these companies, one of the things that, um, and I, this is probably relevant to a lot of people in this room, but one of the things that we found was that 
people who are technologists who are building these products very often were not in close communication with either the privacy professionals in their companies or the lawyers in their companies. So they didn't necessarily have a lot of feedback loop in terms of, you know, as you're developing a social media platform, for instance, are you making the right design choices? Are you making the right choices in general to ensuring that people's privacy is protected? That was often happened in the aftermath. Hello. Um, so I have heard a lot of what you're saying, and I think in the discussion of privacy in general, that seems to indicate it's very like an individual versus corporation type of thing. And you have really touched, I think, a bit on my question throughout, but I just wanted to ask you kind of point blank, have you heard any individual arguments beyond like, I can't use this app that because of the people that built the app decided right. not to use location or something, like any individual arguments against some of the privacy regulations that we'd like to see? No, um, <laughs> at least not meaningful ones, right? Um, because I do often think it comes down to convenience. And one thing we haven't talked about yet is kind of the reality of these technologies are widening um, income inequality and the digital divide. Um, if you are wealthy in this country or if you're educated or if you just even understand this technology on the most basic levels, there are many levers that you have and ways that you can pay or um, even just you know, opt into systems that are far less invasive than if you aren't. And I think one of the things um, that was really eye-opening to me was how algorithms are being made in so many social programs today in terms of, um, I, was thinking, I was thinking about this case in Arkansas about algorithms that are making decisions around Medicaid and um, a court case the ACLU brought, and the lawyer for the ACLU was talking about how he had to challenge this algorithm in court, um, but he didn't know how it worked. And so they gave him an out, and there was some proprietary information around it. So he had to basically go to academic engineers, and they had to teach him in a couple of days how to read the algorithm to understand the um, biased decisions that it was making. And you know, I think that um, as we go on, we're just going to increasingly kind of see government agencies and corporations and all of, and other entities making decisions via algorithm. And I don't, I, part of the reason I don't think we're hearing individuals necessarily vocalizing more deeper concerns is because they just don't understand that reality. And, and it's still, I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive or to suggest that people um, don't have the education. I just think it, it happens behind closed doors and people aren't aware, they don't have the transparency to understand how much of their lives are being touched by it. Um, but no, I, I really haven't, I haven't heard anyone talk beyond convenience. Convenience is the number one thing I've heard. We've heard, we actually, and then again, we've heard from, for instance, parents of children who have um, rare diseases who have been pushing for the idea of sharing information because um, of the, um, benefits in uh, pharmaceutical uh, innovation. And then there's just always, I mean, the other argument you constantly hear, you hear this from industry, but you also hear from individuals. We have this deep, deep-seated ethos in the United States of innovation and entrepreneurship and wanting to be on the cutting edge. And some people worry that if you start to curtail the collection of data, you might end up um, stopping that innovation. I just, I just don't buy that myself, personally. I think that innovation can happen even if we do have um, more guardrails in place. Yeah. The notion of, of the, the growing privacy divide is one that we've had some conversations here in Michigan about a, a growing concern. And how do we share that at, both from a potential legislative perspective and just from a public conscience perspective? Hi. Uh, in the course of your research, have you noticed any, and somewhat related, uh, have you noticed any trends in people shifting how they search, what they search for, the things that they're researching as a mechanism of the fear of what that might be used for later? Is this, is, are we mutating how people search on a, I guess at a broad enough level that it's making an impact? So, I think there are actually probably people in this room who can answer this question better than I can. But my guess is yes. 
Um, I think that people are increasingly aware of the fact that they are being tracked and, and are probably changing their behaviors because of it. Um, you know, I think I go back to something I said in my talk, which is like, if you knew that you were seeking drug treatment, um, like drug addiction treatment, for instance, and that you were being followed as you went to a methadone clinic every day or an AA meeting, that would probably change your desire to go to those meetings, especially if it could impact your employment history or um, healthcare, um, your ability to have health insurance. And so I don't, I don't know the actual um, research, um, but I, I have to imagine it is. You haven't heard it become conscious. You haven't seen it. I, I have, I, no, I really haven't, but I, I'm, uh, but that's probably for a lack of um, knowledge on my part, not because it's not happening. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for probably two more questions, I think. Hi, hi thanks again for coming to Ann Arbor. Um, so you shared the objectives of the Privacy Project and um, the fact that you believe that the ultimate solution resides in the legislative space. I'm just curious to know your opinion of what educational institutions like ours here at the University of Michigan um, can contribute towards uh, pretty much privacy as a, as a human right, as a basic right. I think one of the things that actually surprised me the most, and this is probably because I am uh, a parent, is I was actually shocked by how much surveillance technology is being used at primarily elementary schools, but, but also um, at higher education institutions. So I think, first of all, like the University of Michigan, which it sounds like it already is, holding itself to a higher standard of protecting privacy of its students. But more just the research, like the research you guys are doing, you know, just over lunch I heard about a really amazing um, in-depth research and technology that's being developed here that is gonna be groundbreaking and going to really help the public. So that kind of where it comes that's kind of where we come in as the Times. Like, share that with us. Reach, reach out to us. Let us know if you want to write, um, you know, uh, an op-ed or want to be connected to some of our journalists in the newsroom. We are very invested as a news organization in this question of privacy and technology in general. Over the past two years, we've added a tremendous number of reporters and other journalists to specifically look at this kind of information. The other thing, and this is a little bit of a sensitive thing to say, but when you can, share data. Share data with us, like let, to, to journalism, journalists specifically, or even lawmakers and other kinds of entities, so that we can understand the deep, um, the deep, deep <laughs> stretch of this data and where it's being, where it's going. You know, some of the most fascinating journalism that's been done on this topic, both at the Times and elsewhere, Think of places like Motherboard or Vice or The Verge, um, the Washington Post, has been because researchers and academics have essentially been whistleblowers and have been willing to put themselves on the line so that we have a better understanding as the public um, to what these practices are. Faculty and researchers in the audience, <laughs> online, <laughs> in person, take note. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll let your, your, your powers of be. I'll tell you if that's the right thing to do, but it's something I would encourage. <laughs> so the University of Michigan is actually, our current president is very committed to public engagement, so that does fit into the spirit of what we do. So I think at least one more question, and then, they'll, then I think we're heading into a break. That's uh, another question that's uh, as much for you as for the researchers in this room. Is there a difference in approach to privacy, a generational difference? So people of my age are sacrificing privacy because they don't know any better. But there, there is uh, the younger generation who kind of, yeah, you know, I'll post everything. And there were stories about people losing their jobs or getting into a lot of trouble <laughs> because of the things they shared. So is there a difference, difference in approach? So that's a fascinating take on it. I think one of the things, another glimmer of hope, is I actually find young people are way more conscious of the trade-offs that they're making. And I think that we've, we've found that, particularly in a, um, a lot of the pieces that we've commissioned, that the younger the writer, the more they understand this, and the more they understand the technology to begin with, but they also understand kind of the stakes, and <coughs> they aren't sharing, I mean, 
I actually think we have to worry more about people from like age 30 to 50, uh, 60 who didn't grow up with this technology. Um, you know, particularly around social media. We, we, Saul mentioned that we have done a couple of different pieces about screen time for kids. And that's a really important topic. But actually, one of my colleagues I noticed today was talking on social media about um, screen time for 50-year-olds, like, I mean, you know, like, if you're on an airplane, who is complaining about the lack of Wi-Fi? It is not the children, like, um, you know, and I, I think that because, you know, I grew up kind of at, I'm probably the youngest person who grew up in a space, or I'm part of the youngest cohort that grew up in a space that didn't necessarily have the internet and some of these online technologies, and I actually worry more about people in my cohort because we weren't, you know, my family got AOL when I was about 13 years old, um, and you know, um, I and we had Prodigy before that, and so you know, but I grew up in the Pacific Northwest where there were a lot of companies that were doing this kind of work, um, and so I had an email when I was in high school, but most people didn't. And I worry a little bit about that group of people and what they're sharing and what they're willing to share and kind of not having, again, this all comes down to education. I was talking about earlier, like I was at a CVS recently and someone asked me for my social security number. And like, I just knew to ask like, why do you need my social security number? Like, what is the purpose of that? Like, why does that have to do with this prescription? And I ended up talking to a state agency official in order to get the prescription I needed, but it was kind of worth it. And I think like that kind of pushing back um, and trying to like really question why people are asking for this information is kind of key to this. And I do think younger people are much more willing to challenge those kinds of requests because they just have to live in this space already than necessarily older people. So I think let's leave it at that glimmer of hope <laughs> and maybe punch in a hole in a few balloons about assumptions about our youth. Katie, thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I think we're heading into a break. Uh, somewhere across the way there are posters, there are our, uh, our privacy clinic, there's refreshments, so enjoy and we'll reconvene here in about a half an hour.